Welcome to this third lecture on commas, and uh, this should be our final one. Um, so let's get started. Uh, we have done all of our rules, all of our comma rules. Let's do a super quick reminder. Uh, we put a comma after dear blank blank comma if it's a personal letter. Whether it's personal or professional, we put a comma after our closing. When we're doing the date, we put a comma after the day of the week and a comma after the particular date. We don't put a TH, we just keep it as a number, and we always put a comma after the year when we have a complete date. If we just say the month and the year, we don't need any commas at all. When we are doing um, uh, addresses, we do it after um, the, the uh, city, and we do it after the zip code um, as a unit, um, but we don't put a comma right here between the state and the zip code. If it is a four-digit number, we don't use any commas because we follow the blue book, so we're on rule four here. If it's five digits or more, we put commas in groups of three. If we're using an interruptive, I'm sorry, if we have an introductory material such as according to, followed by an independent clause, we use a comma unless it's very, very short. And even then we might use a comma. If it's interruptive, and by, by definition, interruptive means it's interrupting the sentence, so it's in the middle, we're going to set it off in commas. And we never start a sentence with the word however. If we have two adjectives in front of the noun, if we could remove the comma and use and, and it makes sense, then we, and it, we can certainly present it that way with the and, but if we choose not to, and we take the and away, then we'll need to put a comma between the two. If we have a phrase that's contrast, this is kind of like an interruptive, we're gonna set it off in commas. Again, when we set things off in commas, in many cases, what we're doing is we're saying, this is just FYI, a little interesting factoid. We're not, uh, it's not essential to the sentence. You can pretend it's not there. That's one of the roles of the comma, and that would be the case here. We don't need not the defendant in order to make it a sentence. If we have three or more items in a sequence, we need to have commas, including a comma before the and. That's what we call the Oxford comma. We need to have it in legal documents. Um, and then number 10 we'll get to in a second. That's the one we've saved. And then we, if we have an appositive, which is renaming or redefining the noun that comes before it, we're going to set that off in commas. Again, it's not necessary to the meaning of the sentence, so um, we don't um, have to use it. And um, therefore, it's more like a parenthetical statement. And we also talked in Rule 12 about how we set up quotes. We, um, if we start with an introduction like, she said, we need to put a comma um, before it. If we end our quote with a, she said, then we will need to put a comma at the end of our quote. And if we do an interruption, then we will need to do a comma here and a comma here after our interruption if this first item isn't a complete sentence. And finally, we talked about that and which is clause. Pretty complicated topic, can be confusing. Don't trust your ear on uh, Rule 13 situations. Be sure to check it until you've worked it out and committed it to memory. Okay, now let's go back and do number 10, the one that we hadn't covered before. Um, this one isn't an especially hard one. But this is one that is really awful if you miss, in my opinion. It really um, takes away pretty dramatically from uh, the impression that you're creating. And so let's talk about that. Um, and we've actually already done a few of these examples, um, but I want to uh, more formally do this. Okay, so in order to have a Rule 10, we need an independent clause and we need another independent clause. And we're trying to put these two independent clauses in the same sentence. Um, let's refresh about what is in an independent clause. And here we have our rules. An independent clause can stand alone as a sentence, so it has to have a subject, it has to have a verb, and it must express a complete idea or thought. 
it has to be able to function as a sentence. Well, when we have two independent clauses, one solution is to make each one a sentence. So period and period. And I'm just going to make a sentence here. Fido is a dog. Fido barks. Okay. So we have our first independent clause. Fido is our subject. Is is our verb. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Fido is a dog. Expresses a complete thought. So we do have an independent clause. It can be a standalone sentence. Our next sentence has a subject of Fido. And it has... Um, the verb barks and it does express a complete idea. Sorry. That. So we have an independent clause which can stand alone as a sentence. So this is correct. Obviously, if I have two senses, I have to capitalize the first word of both. Well, that's not an issue because Fido is a proper noun, noun anyway. But I need to have a period in at least one space between the senses and a period at the end because these aren't questions. Okay. But I have other choices. There are other things I can do with these two sentences. I can put them into one sentence. If I do this, I have a run-on sentence, meaning I have two independent clauses that I have not appropriately punctuated. It is possible it's not even hard to have two independent clauses in a single sentence but it does require some punctuation and so this is a run-on sentence it's grammatically incorrect we don't want to do that many times people kind of have a sense now wait a second um, I, I when I read the or when I say these two sentences I pause right here so maybe in their minds they think well since I'm pausing Maybe I ought to put a comma. And so it's pretty common. Let's just read it so you can hear it. Fido is a dog. Fido barks. Okay, that pause was pretty clear, so they might be tempted to put a comma here. But if you go over our list of comma rules, there is no rule that says put a comma between two independent clauses. It doesn't exist because it's not a rule. Many people call this a comma splice or a sentence splice. It's grammatically incorrect. It does not impress. So don't do it. Okay, but let's say we really love the comma and we want to put a comma here. Okay, we can do it. It's not even hard. What we need to be successful in this area, I'm just going to move this down here. Oops, didn't need to move it quite that far, um, is we need a fanboys. This is a mnemonic device to remember coordinating conjunctions. Coordinating conjunctions are super cool. All of the cool kids use these all of the time. Um, and um, coordinating conjunctions are um, conjunctions that uh, or a conjunction that unites two independent clauses and doesn't demote one of those independent clauses to a dependent clause. It treats them as equals. It is an egalitarian punctuation tool. It coordinates, it doesn't demote. It treats both with respect and courtesy. It's a gracious, polite conjunction. Okay? So let's list them. One is for, another is and, another is nor. We have but, we have or, we have yet, I'm sorry, and we have so. So when you say fanboys, it sounds like it's a plural word, but really the S here is actually one of the fanboys. So it's correct to say, I'm going to take a fanboys to do X or whatever. And I guess if you wanted to make it plural, which I guess you would never want to do, but you could say fanboys is. Okay, so. We know we can't just have a comma here, but rule 10 says if we have an independent clause and we want to use a fanboys to unite them, and I'm just going to pick and, we put a comma right here. So we have our independent clause, comma immediately after, a space, a fanboys, a space, and then our next sentence. I'm going to switch this to he. You can see this would not ordinarily be capitalized. Then we end with a period. So this is correct. 
I mean, we could use something other than and, but and makes sense in this condition. And so you, know, you obviously have to use one that makes sense. So this is strategy one. This is strategy two. Um, let's look at strategy three. Strategy three is my favorite. So I'm going to go back and copy this. Copy so I can because I'm, you know, lazy. So this is the lazy person's approach to, so I'm going to say this is number one, this is number two, and this is number three. Okay, so this is, let's say, this is where I am, and I'm just like, well, gosh, uh, I can see this is a run-on sentence. I can't submit that. What's the easiest way? How many, what's the shortest number of keys I have to hit to make this grammatically correct? Well, it's a semicolon, and a semicolon is, is the, the winking button. It's the comma below the dot, and so what this says is, I've, what the semicolon says is I've got an independent clause in front of me, I've got an independent clause after me, and the two independent clauses are closely related so they belong in the same sentence. If you use a semicolon, you don't need a coordinating conjunction. In fact, I would say if you're going to use a coordinating conjunction, use the comma instead. So we have a, a third approach. There's even a fourth approach, but this one isn't, e I'm sorry, isn't easy. It's not hard, but it's not easy. And, and this is what we would use a um, um, subordinating conjunction. Um, so we would use one like this. Um, although Fido is a dog, he, oh, sorry, he barks. And I realize this sentence doesn't make sense because although implies that there's some uh, disagreement between these two facts and in fact dogs do bark um, so my choice of although is strange um, how about this let's say because because Fido is a dog he barks so what we've done is we've taken this perfectly good independent clause and demoted it now this can't be its own sentence I mean I can't put a period here and have a sentence I mean this doesn't make sense as a sentence because Fido is a dog. Okay, well, I get the fact that Fido is a dog, but uh, the fact that Fido is a dog apparently leads to another fact, but you're not telling me what the other fact is. So we don't have an independent clause because of the um, a subordinating conjunction in front of it. So you can use a subordinating conjunction on one of your facts, and um, then you have a subordinate conjunction or dependent, con uh, a, excuse me, a subordinate clause or a dependent clause, and then you have an independent clause. And you know you can pick either one to subordinate. You could say because he barks, Fido is a dog. Fido is a dog. This doesn't exactly make sense, but um, it can work that way. It, you can also do it this way. Um, Fido is a dog because he barks. Fido barks because he is a dog. You may notice that when it leads a sentence, when it's that introductory material, I think that's rule five, we need a comma before the independent clause. And it doesn't matter which one's the independent clause. So we were applying rule five in both of these cases. But when we put the dependent clause at the end of the sentence, obviously rule five doesn't apply and we don't have any other rule that tells us to put a comma. So it is incorrect to put a comma here. That is wrong. That is evil and dastardly, and you don't want to do that. It would be wrong to put it here, so don't do it. Um, that's a very common error. Um, one, uh, so even though it's, it works in the front, it doesn't work in the back. So we have now gone over four ways of taking two independent clauses that are next to each other and um, having a... Uh, uh, grammatical way of handling this material. 
Okay, so um, let's go and officially look at Rule 10 so we can say that we've covered it. Use a comma to separate two independent clauses connected by a coordinating conjunction, namely, and here they are. Um, they, the, the textbook does say that the comma may be omitted um, if the second clause is short, generally five words or fewer. Um, let me give you an example of, oh, sorry, of a super short one. Um, we use the comma here, and we could use it. It's always, uh, it's always okay to use it, but because these sentences are so short, um, it's so clear what we mean that the comma really doesn't add a lot. Um, I would still probably use the comma, though. Let me give you an example where I probably would, because you can carry this to a ridiculous extent. Go and eat. This is actually, this is a, a um, independent clause. The, this is the verb, the subject you is understood, it's a command. And eat is the verb in our second independent clause. Again, the you is understood, it's a command. And so technically we could put a come here, go and eat. Uh, that seems a little over the top. It would be grammatically correct, but I probably wouldn't do it for one word phrases. For three word phrases, I might. I wouldn't think less of you if you didn't. If you're getting up to five, I'm starting to feel like you probably ought to. So I would probably put a few more commas in than they're suggesting here. Um, and keep in mind that you don't use the comma if um, the clause can't stand on its own. Let me give you an example of that. Okay. Let's see, um, Bob likes to eat apples. Bob likes to drink milk, okay? So we have our two independent clauses. We have the subject here, Bob. We have a verb, likes to eat. Bob likes to eat apples, complete thought, com independent clause. We have Bob here being our subject. Oh, wait a second. We have likes to drink being our verb. Bob likes to drink milk, a complete thought. So we are in good shape. We have two independent clauses. And um, one thing that we could do is we could remove the period, put a comma, and put the word and. Bob likes to eat apples and Bob likes to drink milk. Okay, that's a perfectly grammatically correct sentence. We could also do this. We could put a semicolon here in a space. Bob likes to eat apples and Bob, excuse me, Bob likes to eat apples, Bob likes to drink milk. But let's switch things up a little bit. Let's say we wrote it like this. Bob likes to eat apples and likes to drink milk. I mean, the sentence means the same thing, right? But we can't put a comma here. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, everybody does it. Well, if everybody jumped off a cliff, would you jump? No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I mean, don't jump off the cliff. But um, just because it's a common error doesn't mean you should per perpetuate the error. This is not right. None of our rules permit this. You might be thinking, but doesn't rule 10 permit this? Well, no, because keep in mind we have this little exception. A comma is not needed, and in fact, this isn't strong enough. The comma is not appropriate before a coordinating conjunction if that clause, if the clause that follows can't stand on its own. Well, let's see if it can stand on its own. Likes to drink milk. Okay, we do have a verb, so we're good there. But we don't know who likes to drink milk. If this is all we're seeing, we don't know who likes to drink milk. So we don't have a subject. We don't have a complete thought. We have to borrow Bob over here. Bob has to do double duty. Bob has to like to eat apples, okay, but he also has to like to drink milk. So we're repeating Bob. But we have to jump across this comma. Well, guess what? You're not supposed to separate your subject from your predicate. This is what a predicate is. Um, with a comma, and so this comma is incorrect.
and we do not want to do that. So uh, be on the lookout for that. That's a very common error that I see in uh, assignments. Okay, I want to show you the comma rules. This is my distillation of the rules. Um, uh, and you'll see they're numbered just like Aspen has them. This is posted on uh, Canvas. And I have a few examples. So this might be a good cheat sheet. What you might want to do is um, print this out on two-sided paper, laminate it, and then be able to, to flip it back and forth if you want to. You don't have to laminate it, but that's, a, that's an idea. Now you can see that I actually have more than uh, 13 rules. I've added three rules because, as I say, Aspen doesn't cover everything. So I just wanted to briefly cover the, the three, three additional rules. Use a comma before confirming questions. Okay, so we have here, you like to read. That's a statement. We have a verb, excuse me, we have a noun, you. We have like to read, a verb. It com has a complete thought, so it's an independent clause. But we're not just making a statement, we want some confirmation. You like to read, don't you? And this is a common structure in English. It sounds like we're disputing this fact, right? It sounds like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. You like to read, but maybe you don't like to read. So it doesn't make a lot of sense the way we say this, but we say it all the time. And so we're expecting the other person to say, yeah, yeah, I like to read. So you're almost challenging them, although usually this isn't said in a hostile way. You're challenging them, hey, go ahead and disagree with me because I know you're not going to because I know you agree with this. Okay, so this is a, um, a confirming question approach. And you can see if we leave out the comma, you like to read, don't you? That's confusing. That comma helps us make sense of these two ideas. Now, of course, you're not actually going to use this in formal writing because, you know, I mean, it really sounds weird. You like to read, do you not? Nobody says that. Nobody even writes that, right? That sounds weird. Um, and I don't want to make you a, uh, just because you're grammatically correct, a grammatically correct nerd. Um, and so it doesn't make sense to ask these confirming questions unless you're using contraction, but you can't use a contraction. But I wanted you to know the rule because in your other life that may be very fulfilling when you're not writing legal stuff, you may occasionally write a contraction and you may occasionally use one of these confirming sentences. And I want you to know that you can, in fact, punctuate it. Another thing is if you're using some of these titles here, especially Esquire, you're going to see this a lot, is you're going to use it to separate the names. You're going, so let's say Mr. Green, or actually Dr. Green here has a PhD. Well, you're going to use um, a comma after his name before his title, PhD, Esquire, MD, whatever it is, and then a comma after um, the, the uh, honorific or the, the title. And again, we do this because this is a parenthetical information. This is more information about John Green, but it doesn't change who John Green is. It doesn't help us sort through that we happen to know 12 John Greens. No, we know which John Green we're talking about. Oh, and, and he's going to attend. Oh, and by the way, he's got this particular degree. So it's like the which situation. Um, it's a non-restrictive situation. And then the last rule is a, is a kind of catch-all catch rule. You're going to want to add a comma when it helps the reader make sense of the sentence, even if there isn't a particular rule that uh, points you in that direction. Now, I will tell you that you don't want to abuse this. Um, it's going to be rare that you are going to rely upon this rule, but there will be times that you will. Um, and here's an example. The question is, is it wise to invest in this market? Well, it would be odd if we were to have it this way. The question is, is your first thought, if you're the reader, is, oh, there's a typo there. And so now you're trying to figure out, well, is that a typo? No. I, I, oh, oh, now I get it. Well, you don't want the reader to have to struggle that way. But if they see the comma, they'll know to pause. The question is, is it wise to invest in this market? And then they'll get it right. So you're looking for cases like this. You don't want to sprinkle your writing with lots of other commas. So my guess is you'll use rule 16, you know, once a month or maybe two times a month. Uh, in a five-page document, if you uh, do more than one rule 16, that would be unusual. So uh, don't abuse this one. Use it when it's appropriate, but mainly count on relying upon one of the other rules.
I hope that this presentation has been helpful. Um, again, use the resources that I have provided on um, uh, uh, canvas uh, all the exercises and things and if you continue to have questions about commas come see me I'll be delighted to spend some time with you go over the exercises and many of the exercises you can complete and then look at the answer key to confirm that you're on the right track and if you get it wrong then maybe do a little bit of review and see where you went awry a comma usage isn't something you can listen to a few lectures on and now it all makes sense. It's like riding a bicycle, or it's like learning to ride a bicycle but never actually getting on the bike. It, that, that's not how it works. It's a skill. It's not just facts, but um, a muscle that you need to exercise. And so uh, use it. Think about this. If I, if I were uh, in, this, in this part of my career and I'm not fully confident about commas, I would be whenever I write, being trying to make sure that I'm using the commas as, as is correct so I can get into those habits and kind of commit those rules to memory. But I'd also use my cheat sheet. I'd want to confirm that I'm using the rules as they uh, should be used. I hope that this comma information has been helpful. Thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day.